Okay, uh, welcome back everybody. I think we're uh, ready to begin this uh, final session of the afternoon. Uh, my name is Simu Kai Chiguru. I'm a lecturer in development studies here at the University of Oxford. Um, and it's a real privilege to host this, uh, or to chair this session on finance, politics and development. Um, I'd like to begin actually just by commending uh, both Charles and Alexa on pulling together a truly fantastic uh, program. Thinking about the complexities of <coughs> finance and debt uh, in Africa, I think we've been talked through a range of different issues from the complexity of banking systems, both on the continent and also internationally. Um, we've had the opportunity to reflect on the uh, various facets of the debt crisis and, and the number of vexing issues this raises for uh, borrowing, for lending, for, for, for government planning, and for the role of multilateral institutions, as well as for private investors. Uh, but I think that in this panel, we have the chance to broaden that discussion uh, further still and start to think about how our uh, financial systems uh, sort of permeate some of the most fundamental um, aspects of social and political life on the African continent. Uh, what comes to my mind is actually from my own work. So back in 2015, I was doing uh, research uh, for my doctorate, which was on the politics of a cholera outbreak in Zimbabwe. Sitting in uh, a ministerial office at the Ministry of Health, uh, I managed to secure an interview with a very senior uh, civil servant who had been involved in the cholera response in Zimbabwe at the time. Uh, during the course of my interview, I, I put the question squarely to her. I said, okay, look, uh, the cholera outbreak became this sort of intensely uh, politicized and disputed uh, event uh, back in 2008, and I'd love to get your take on why it happened. Uh, and she said to me rather grimly, when you look at cholera, it's not a healthcare issue. It only happens when people eat shit. And by that she meant that despite the moribund state of Zimbabwe's healthcare system in 2008, the true drivers of the outbreak were to be found in the sort of social conditions of daily life. These, she went on to argue, were shaped by the country's political economy, by the uh, financial crisis that the country was faced in, which then affected service delivery, opportunities for investment and growth, and then downstream had the effects of what people were actually able to eat, whether they had access to clean water and safe food. Um, all of this to say that what begins uh, initially as an abstract discussion um, about rates, premiums, and bonds comes to bear on the lives that people live on the ground. And so we're very lucky this afternoon to have an esteemed panel to discuss various facets of these issues in education and health. Uh, I'm going to give a very brief uh, introduction to the, the speakers. Uh, we're just going to go by first names as they did in the last panel uh, and title. Uh, full biographies are, of course, uh, available uh, in the Welcome Pack. Uh, so to my far right, we have um, David, who's university reader here in Oxford in comparative and international education, and he's going to kick off uh, he's going to kick off the panel. Uh, following him will be um, Cyrus, who is a senior fellow um, at the... Uh, I'm going to get this, uh, uh, this wrong. Um, it's the, is it the, Center, uh, the Center for International Governance and, uh, and Innovation. Um, and Cyrus himself is no uh, stranger to Oxford, having been here as an undergraduate. Um, and then we have Seth, who will be our, our final speaker from the day, who's a former minister of uh, finance and uh, economic planning uh, from Ghana. Um, the speakers have all been instructed to, sti to stick faithfully um, to their 12-minute addresses, uh, which should give us enough time uh, for a robust discussion um, at the end of the presentations. So I'll hand over uh, to you, David, uh, to, to begin your talk. Thanks very much. Just a, a well, 12 minutes, so I'll, I'll raise just a few issues, really. Two issues that I want to raise in this paper first, and I suspect has been largely uh, debated <coughs> more or less fully in this symposium, is, of course, how to close the financial gap in education through the transformation of um, and in the financial sectors. Uh, the second that I intend to dwell on a little more is the use of public and other finances uh, to transform the educational system. And I suggest that these two things don't go hand in glove. So making more money available uh, for public expenditure on education uh, doesn't necessarily transform the educational system so that it is inclusive, uh, fair in uh, both access, um, uh, participation, and indeed uh, in output. I'll make um, 
reference to the case of Sudan uh, as I speak since 2012. I've been a, a member of a, a World Bank uh, team working on Sudan uh, in the uh, development and uh, sort of monitoring, seeing through, uh, helping the country in its uh, basic education recovery program and my specific role has been to establish <coughs> and roll out the first ever national learning assessment across 18 states in that country. I've just recently returned where we've begun to roll out the second uh, uh, of its kind three years later and the results uh, still hot on the, uh, on the old uh, statistical packages are, are beginning to show some interesting uh, some, some, well, there's some interesting results, and um, I won't, of course, dwell on the results, but just uh, raise uh, some of the, the questions here. So um, there has been, as, as, as of course, uh, comes as no surprise, a yawning gap in public financing for social service provision in, in Africa, and specifically the education uh, sector. After decades in search of the most durable and the most efficient mechanisms for enabling African governments to fulfill their obligations to their citizens, including through bilateral and multilateral agreements aimed at complementing public finances uh, and fast-track initiatives <coughs> aimed at uh, faster delivery of aid. Um, international commitments haven't always been honored. So it's uh, really with great applause that we uh, look at the recent global partnership for education replenishment um, event that took place in February in Senegal. Um, that appears to be a sort of landmark moment for, uh, for education. Over $2 billion was pledged by donors for the, for the GDE core fund to support um, developing countries that have credible education sector plans. Additionally, over $30 billion was pledged by the countries themselves, presidents and ministers, um, to their own citizens, <coughs> increasing this projected budget from $80 billion to $110 billion. Uh, so the provision of education that is uh, good quality, equitable, accessible by all is, of course, an obligation of the government, but due to the sheer magnitude of the elements of the educational system, ranging from teacher salaries to early childhood care and provision, the building of schools and the funding of scholarships and textbooks and so on and so forth, it hasn't always been manageable and so it's really not an, um, a, a, a task that national governments themselves can cope with without uh, support. The support often comes uh, from other agencies, private sector, uh, citizens uh, themselves, so it's really quite important to see um, the new uh, development of uh, <coughs> partnerships of private capital, the new global business coalition, for example, on education that includes major companies like Microsoft, like Intel, KPMG, Pearson, and so on, all um, absolutely going in the right direction. Uh, but, of course, um, there are also <coughs> potentially problems when government is not clear in terms of the policy frameworks and its understanding of its responsibilities uh, that things are likely to go awry and people uh, begin to feast on uh, an educational system that, as Marx would have it, uh, where the government has begun to wither away and it's left to tendencies um, uh, 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 you know, else, elsewhere to begin to, uh, to, profit, to profit us. So um, I have actually on slides, um, given some, um, <coughs> just some indication of what uh, public expenditure in education looks like in Sudan. I mean, this is a country, of course, that has uh, had <coughs> long periods of uh, conflict. I mean, you know, the, the peace dividend uh, we thought had been uh, reaped with the signing of um, an accord uh, a decade or so ago. Um, and to a large degree, uh, the north of the country, or Sudan itself, is, uh, is reasonably stable with pockets of uh, conflict, but of course, South Sudan is not, and there is a huge uh, increase in 
uh, internally displaced people who uh, uh, enter Sudan, especially around the West Darfur, East Darfur, and other um, uh, regions, that puts a huge burden on the educational uh, system. These are, of course, uh, people, peoples of Sudan, and it would be irresponsible, to say the least, for governments to neglect that um, particular need. So, uh, although the share of um, expenditure to education has, uh, has gone up, uh, and uh, there is a decline in the sense of uh, recurrent expenditure, uh, there is a still a yawning uh, gap in, um, in educational uh, financing uh, in Sudan. Um, I don't know how clear these, um, these slides are, but uh, as I said, I was, I'm just whipping through this uh, presentation. Uh, here we can see um, even where <coughs> national budgets appear on the, on, on, on the face of it to be uh, improving and increasing. I mean, Sudan has actually done quite a remarkable job. It spends less than any other African country on its educational system as a share of GDP, by far. But it is the most efficient country in Africa if one looks at indices such as uh, gender parity in access to schools. Of course, it has a, a large share of students who do not go to school, who never will go to school, so um, uh, that, that particular sector. But, ab but absolutely, when, uh, when, when the numbers are, 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 are crunched, it, it does use whatever little resource it has more efficiently than elsewhere. And this is an interesting cultural question. How does it do it? Um, but the, the important thing about Sudan, and this is really the crux of the paper, you know, here you can see, that, you know, it, 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 it's a vast country. The federal government, of course, you know, develops a policy framework, um, transmits financing to states who then um, have uh, the, the decision about how those, how those finances are spent. I don't know if the slide is clear, but it's absolutely clear that different states spend the resource they have differently. For most states, mo or all of them mostly, spend 90% uh, or more on recurrent expenditure for teachers. This is the highest, um, the, the highest um, uh, sh uh, share of money, apart from perhaps uh, the northern state, which uses a, a significant slice of its budget to provide goods and services, which include learning materials and textbooks, um, and so on and so forth. So um, you can also see that in these states, there's a large dependency on the share of finances produced by communities themselves. So PTAs are parent-teacher associations. They raise money largely to provide meals for teachers, often housing. Um, there, there's a, a huge randomness in the distribution of teachers um, to schools across different states, which is a, which is a, a fascinating problem that Sudan, uh, that Sudan has, which in itself <coughs> creates a, a, a huge degree of inequity uh, in outcomes. But here is just an illustration of how different states, um, in a sense, in the politest uh, uh, form of the term, tax their communities um, two minutes to support uh, education. Uh, so that being as it may, in the national learning assessment that uh, we conducted the first uh, <coughs> round in 2014, I think it was, uh, that graph shows the share of students in grade three, so 80-year-olds, who have never been taught to read. So the 70%, 76% uh, <coughs> or whatever that is in central Darfur, is the share of children who are not learning at all, rather than children learning. And you can see the decrease. Uh, putting together the, the, um, the share of uh, state of, of, of um, uh, finances by or, or, or the manner in which <coughs> educational expenditure is used, um, we've seen in 2017 
through a, a, a really important uh, input, which was uh, making available to communities finances that they have control of. So providing to schools school grants that schools have control of, rather than putting money into the government central pot. And the result of that has been a fascinating reduction in those students, those children, not learning. Um, some states have done well, particularly the Darfors, uh, and that is also a, 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 an, an outcome of, um, of, of, of the peace uh, dividend uh, in those uh, areas. Some have regressed. And the very final slide, I apologize for whipping through this, they probably don't make sense at all, is a, is, is a, is a, a, a small uh, subsample of about 100 schools that we've been tracking for the last four or five years in which school grants have been made available. And uh, those scores uh, for the intervention group shows um, what their, their mean scores in reading capability was uh, in 2014, the provision of funding to communities, to uh, uh, parent-teacher associations, the use of those fundings more or less ring-fenced for the provision of goods and services, textbooks, um, or textbooks is actually a, a federal uh, thing, but, but other kinds of learning resources and materials has actually had uh, a, a fascinating impact on the improvement of this group when compared to the national sample. And I shall leave you there. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to try and focus on something slightly different to try to um, develop a little bit further the nexus between finance and development. And so I've taken the opportunity of my presentation to try to focus in that area. Also to try and resolve a couple of questions which I think Governor had asked in his uh, opening address, which I think we some way to starting to address, but which I think other forms of finance might be able to help shed further light on. The issue of how to deal with, uh, how to resolve the paradox that uh, funding isn't going to where the greatest return may be. Uh, and also that funding isn't actually necessarily going uh, to the target for development, whether it's in health uh, or education or, or any other a particular developmental objective. So with that as a brief um, background, um, I wanted to try and focus on the issue of innovation in finance. And of course, there's a flood of innovation in the banking sector, but I wanted to try and look at it through a different prism. Um, the one, if we take innovation in the context of finance, I think that there are at least four lenses through which it may be useful to look at it. One is how to attract new investors and recipients. So what in innovation can bring new investors to the development sphere and bring crowd in new resources? Um, and what can bring the resources to recipients that need it? So here I wanted to talk about a, uh, I, I guess, uh, perhaps a next generation um, instrument or, or set of tools. <coughs> Um, uh, which is crowdfunding. The scale is nothing near anything that could possibly match or s adequately supplement banking as a cornerstone of development <coughs> finance. But some of the lessons coming from crowdfunding may very well address some of the principal issues that were discussed earlier or point to potential <coughs> banking and other, and governments indeed can uh, take forward. The second is, how can financing be attracted to new sectors, to sectors which may uh, yield the growth that is needed for <coughs> development? Here I wanted to talk a little bit about financing of the blue economy, the ocean economy. This is the issue of how to finance um, the economic activity that is in the maritime domain. Uh, the, the world, if you just take a look at the world, it's mainly blue. And the resources, the economic growth, the potential to develop is untapped in the blue area. And we'll talk a bit about how the financing is starting to emerge for that and any lessons that may arise which can be linked back into the discourse we had earlier. The third is how to overcome what appear to be historical, institutional, or regulatory challenges in 
releasing funding that happens, we know it's there, but we don't know how to get to it. And here I wanted to talk a little bit about the track record of diaspora finance. Um, and then, I, I think I won't talk about this because this is really <coughs> the, the generation that has come and is being uh, driven forward by the likes of Impesa and the likes of many others on the continent and elsewhere, which is the use of mo uh, mobile uh, technology, um, uh, uh, digital payments, digitization, and so on. There's a whole discourse about that. But there's so many lessons that come from that, which can be reverse engineered into banking, it seems to me, um, that, that could be useful. So that's the context in a certain sense. I realize that half my time is probably gone as well. Um, starting point, where well, we talked about <coughs> debt. I'm um, just about to publish a, a short paper which shows that actually the debt challenge of the most vulnerable African hippies is really probably far worse than we've been describing it so far. And one particular uh, challenge in that is that it's the countries that do not have market access. It's, the, it's not Ghana. It's not those types of countries that face the most profound challenges. That's for another discussion. Um, Infrastructure costs as a starting point. We used to always say it's 93 billion a year. It's gone up. The new analysis of that <coughs> says we need 130 billion. Where is it going to come from? The annual infrastructure gap is 100 billion dollars. We need new innovation and new ways of catalyzing funding. Trade, the whole point about putting the word trade up here in a forum discussing finance is we want economies to grow, but we're forgetting about where that source comes from. It comes from trade. Uh, and particularly in the African context. And we need to find that nexus in development and finance to trade. Um, another issue we don't talk about, which is the access to internet, because that's been the foundation of the platforms that have driven uh, new forms of finance for development through the impesas of the world and through uh, digital money payment systems and so on. What ingredients in any new solutions? Frankly, I think we're going to need another round of debt relief for some countries. We'll just put it out there. We can talk about that another time. We need scale-up access to traditional sources of finance. Um, we also need innovation. So that's where I wanted to talk um, a little about. Sorry, I've gone past one slide, but you can't see the countries. But on um, <coughs> access to internet, African countries are very much at the <coughs> low end of access per, at, at per capita population. Speed of, uh, uh, of access to internet, again, at the very low end. I'm, I'm sorry you can't see all the countries. These are all Commonwealth countries. I, I did it for all the uh, countries. There are 19 African countries in there. So there's a challenge in the foundations of uh, uh, scaling up funding to African countries through new pathways which are built on mobile telephony and uh, internet access and, and money, mobile payment systems. There's a foundational structural problem there, which is the access to internet issue. Crowdfunding. What's the principal issue here that I think very much goes to the points that were made at the opening? Crowdfunding is about many, many investors coming with small amounts of money. They can donate, they can take equity stakes, they can just do it for a reward, get a t-shirt, but they've given some money. They can do it as a loan. And it's built on all the platforms that we talk about, which are the next generation of funding platforms. But crucially, it's doing certain things which can help bridge risk and reward. What is it doing? The due diligence <coughs> for the projects is coming from the investors themselves. They go online and they say, I'm not going to give this money because of this, that, and the other. And you see an enormous trail of discourse about what's important about the investment and why money should or shouldn't go there. The transaction costs are much lower. Intermediary presence is gone. Therefore, the costs are lower. Regulatory intervention so far is limited which is a good and bad thing because they're not being protected as investors. Um, but it's good in that uh, the, the money is flowing more easily. It's considered in advanced economies as a disintermediated investment banking product. Not formally, but that's the way it's being looked at. And it, the scale is enormous in advanced economies. Maybe it can come that way through to social sectors in Africa, as it is already <coughs> starting to do. Recipients are at local level. So the point that the governor made at the beginning, is the money coming to where it ought to be going, where there is great reward, or to SMEs? Well, this product is resolving that issue. Multiple sectors, even some regional governments are starting to look at this as, an as a way of funding their activities. 
and the implications for African development um, so far are not understood very well. 96 billion projected by 2025 by the World Bank. Developing countries last, oh, two years ago, 660 million. Africa, a very small portion <coughs> of that market, so an opportunity. Um, lots of questions about that, I'll leave that for another. The second um, conceptual issue is that there's a vast African blue economy. There are 38 coastal states, 13 square million square kilometers of ocean around the continent that, that can be developed through fisheries, through tourism, through renewable energy, marine, marine renewable energy, through pharmaceuticals. <coughs> if you put on any pharmaceutical product on your body this morning, the chances are that it came from the sea. Yeah? If you take any drugs at any point, the chances are now that they came from the ocean. And the, the, the dollar values are enormous. So there's potential for it. It's not being tapped. Um, it's been termed by the African Union as the new renaissance. The blue economy is the new re renaissance. It's referred to in Agenda 2063, the long-term agenda. There's even a whole roadmap for the blue economy which is not being developed adequately. But there's limited finance and innovation going. Um, and there's one country that's leading financing of it. And there may be lessons that could be learned from that process. Two minutes? OK. We, I'll talk a little bit more about that another time. But um, debt for adaptation swaps are being used to, uh, to pay off uh, significant amounts of debt. In a, this is in a small island economy. And to be used for um, climate adaptation. <coughs> through a quite complex scheme, but very easily able to be emulated elsewhere. Diaspora and diaspora bonds. The African Development Bank put out a, um, a set of policy documents in 2012 and said, diaspora bonds looks good, major challenges. Four countries tried it, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, um, <coughs> Ghana, and one other in, in in an African context, uh, Nigeria recently. Um, three of them failed. The African Development Bank shifted to a new way of looking at diaspora financing, not for the quantitative amount coming, but because of the links to the diaspora, the issue of knowing your customer in a quite different <coughs> way, of knowing your community, knowing why you want to finance, money, uh, finance resources as a diaspora. Uh, but Nigeria last year issued a diaspora bond and broke through certain constraints, which are regulatory constraints in the US and in the UK for listing, and broke through <coughs> constraints in um, the scale of diaspora finance coming through. 300 million issued uh, as a diaspora bond. What's interesting about it, um, the pre risk premium is lower, the yield is lower than the bonds that Nigeria issued, far greater value, regular bonds, but the yields are lower, so it's a cheaper form of financing. Um, and so, simply what I'm, what I'm putting up here is that there may be lessons coming from these new forms of financing that are breaking through information gaps, information asymmetries, understanding clients, understanding community needs, and actually delivering the resources, which the traditional banking sector, however sophisticated, may not be able to. I'll leave it at that. I'll begin by giving the, the context. Uh, sort of financing context for you know the budgets, and then I would <coughs> move to education and health, and then I run up with um, a focus on <coughs> what I call a stratified Africa, and the likely issues that arise, particularly for middle income, <coughs> you know, Africa, um, and the likely uh, building of domestic development. <coughs> Rising of this more, I hope you can see it. <coughs> but I mean, a lot has been said already about the um, the architecture. So most of the expansion we are seeing is by the commercial banks. Um, There's significant electronic tools that are being used, but increasingly, as the governor said, countries like Ghana, Kenya are uh, turning from the central bank to the stock markets, you know, to issue even domestic, you know, bonds because commercial banks are focused on the short end, <coughs> you know, the market. Um, and then uh, following South Africa's examples, 
example, some countries are beginning like Ghana, Kenya uh, Gardens establishing as in banks of trade finance. <coughs> we have mentioned that. You may want to diversify your economy. The question is how do you finance it? Uh, we are experimenting with the establishment of a solo wealth fund, uh, which is a combination of sinking fund and then the <coughs> Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund. Now, in a budget context, um, as I said, there's a lot of focus on SSC and Sub Saharan African you know, budgets on the short term of the market. And these are treasury bills, mainly, and the central bank one to two year notes, which may fall out of favor. You know, with zero financing, <coughs> you know, which um, Ghana started from 2016 going into 2017, as the deputy governor, <coughs> you know, said. Um, this is often part of open market operations. But we came to the conclusion, and by the way, given my accounting background, so in terms of this measure, most of I see things from an accounting, accountant's perspective. They are for liquidity management. <clears throat> and therefore, and I think that is where, the, you know, um, an assessment of zero financing also comes in. Because the danger to the economy <coughs> is usually in the short term. Before governments get revenue, there's a liquidity trap, which, and I think that is something that can be repaid, you know, and I think that we can have a discussion, <coughs> you know, that has a view we have. And then there's the capital markets which are not too developed, you know, as I said, apart from I believe four countries, Nigeria, maybe Kenya, to some extent, Ghana, Côte d'Ivoire, and then South Africa, being the outlier, you may not see enough of capital markets. So one of the challenges for financing, both social infrastructure and commercial infrastructure education health is you know, in that respect. Because infrastructure is infrastructure, you know, whether commercial or social. And we'll come back to that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the medium to long term, so in essence, when we are talking about financing of infrastructure, you know, we are back to conventional sources. And the conventional sources are usually your multilateral or development banks, the World Bank, African Development Bank, you know, being in the day. <coughs> You're talking about bilateral sources, you know, for such as um, the, the China Development Bank, you know, which is the development bank, uh, <coughs> Belendez of uh, Brazil, which is a combination together with ProEx, is a development and an Ezim bank. Then you have the Ezim banks beginning with US Ezim, the advanced ones, uh, you also have EIB and others. But increasingly, you are seeing a number of emerging country Ezim banks turn from trade to capital finance, you know, led by Ezim, you know, China Ezim. And by the way, much of the resources to Africa are not from Chinese government sources. I think we need to know that. There are these two big institutions, mm -hmm. China Development Bank and Exim Bank, who assess financial markets. And they are highly rated, <coughs> very highly rated, gets the money, mixes it up with government money that should have come to developing countries and give preferential credit which is below their rate, low rate of borrowing, you know, and the high rate, <coughs> you know, which is, and they are somewhere in the middle. So I think that it's important to put that, you know, in, in context. India is also coming up and providing, you know, so you have Brazil, India, um, um, China, you know, being the main, so we, we focus a lot on uh, China being the biggest that you have. Brazil and India also, you know, coming in. <coughs> and then, of course, domestic sources, the budget, because um, for most social infrastructure, but a lot of the borrowing goes into for social infrastructure, and I think we need to bear that <coughs> also, in my particular, the multilateral. And then you have aid and grant. There's some aid and grants which is also long-term, you know, like BIFIC, you know, and others, you know, go care of you. So this is, you know, the... <coughs> Now, why do I talk about Stratified Africa? Um, there are eight or nine African countries, Ghana, Kenya, and others, who have become middle income, led originally by Botswana and South Africa, who are losing concessional financing. And if the rate of growth and progress, for example, Ghana gets a fourth oil field, possibly in fifth, 
Ghana will be moving in a multilateral context to IBRD or hybrid. So even within a multilateral context, Ghana is moving, you know, commercial. And so the concessional financing is not going to be available to these countries. And I think it's important to reinforce. There's so much focus on, you know, the fragile and other states, you know, but at least. So you have the middle income countries, you have the low income countries, and in the middle you have those who are aspiring to the middle income <coughs> design, like Ghana did before oil, Rwanda and others having a program to become middle income. So the middle income agenda is something which is very important. And I bring it up because when Ghana became middle income, I got a letter from the World Bank and African Development Bank <coughs> saying you are middle income, you have to borrow harder terms. At an annual meeting, I was meeting both the fund and the bank and I said, what is the agenda for transitioning to middle income? None. And I think this is something which we have to, before <coughs> Africa experiences the middle income trap, <coughs> Latin America and others, you know, are already, you know, in. So, um, <coughs> okay, so that's the middle income agenda. We can come, you know, back to it. But it's against the background of green day, you know, unless you are going to opt not to, you know, to be part of it. Because Nigeria is the other one, you know, which I wanted to remember. So again, this is similar to um, the table that was presented, and I'm here going into education and health. What I have here is Ghana's budget classified for 2017, and as has been said already, 40.9% is already going to compensation for education, another 13% for health, so between the two, 54%. So there is resources going to education. Then you have for goods and services, between them they are taking 33%. Of course what is happening is that as a result of these high ratios, capital is being crowded out. But I'll come to Ghana's game market, you know, on this on this front. <coughs> um, then you do have internally generated funds where government sees some of the fees, non tax revenue. And again, these two dominate. They take 74% of all retain facts for income and fees. So sometimes the issue, I think as has been pointed, is quality, you know, not quantity. But yesterday you see a lot of pressure, you know, on, and what I've just stated is in graphical form, you can see, you know, the yellow in terms of the, um, the yellow being very strong with uh, compensation, as I said, and then with internally generated funds. That's the yellow, as you can see. <coughs> um, this again is, um, the same thing, but presented in, in another format, and you can see the spikes, um, education and health, uh, in relation to, um, yeah, and the total. Now, <coughs> Ghana has a unique budget structure, we call it year marking, where you have the Ghana Education Trust Fund, education. You have the District Assemblies Common Fund, going to sub-national governments, and the subnational governments use, I would say, 30 to 40 percent education and health because that's the main. And then you have the national health insurance, health. You know, so these are yeah, the dedicated sources of financing. And the interesting thing here is that if you take each of them, they tend to grow with the economy. That's the red line, you know, which you see. So it's not as if they are being deprived. Resources as the economy kept growing, you know, because they are at value rate, either a percentage of tax or a percentage of you know total you know revenue. And so I just want to bring attention again to, to quality. <clears throat> now, um, in conclusion, what one is saying is there's a lot of earmarking, uh, and in many countries, many grants and others, which if you pull together, you know, channeling a lot of resources into. We are also going to see a lot of uh, countries, you know, not getting some of the concessional financing. If you take, therefore, loans and debt service, and you see then the, uh, the capital gap is filled. From the budget, it's low. But if you take, and I don't, I have that statistics, but for interest of time, you know, we didn't bring it. So for the middle income countries, you know, in our debt management strategy, you know, we said that as Ghana's access to concessional financing dwindles, it should devote those resources to uh, social infrastructure. 
education and health. And this is where self-financing and some of our debt managers talk about. Every commercial project should pay for itself. And as we, you know, <clears throat> and this is not new. Uh, Akosomo Dam paid for itself. Uh, in fact, the Terminal 3, which is being constructed, if you happen to fly into Accra, is being paid from Esco in, you know, uh, airport tax, which is in forest. And it was enough to backstop the loan for the government not to give a guarantee. I think mean, I spoke about guarantees, you know, and their, their effect. So besides the sinking fund, you have other measures as the self-financing and others which, you know, um, <clears throat> for lack of time we cannot go into. But these are areas, you know, for, you know, managing um, debt as part of the transition for Africa's middle-income countries that have market access. I think we need to develop these market tools, including, you know, hedging, you know, so as we mentioned, we need to. And this is where my call area in the morning in my intervention comes in. That we get a lot of technical assistance on revenue generation. We get a lot of technical assistance on uh, expenditure management. But so for as long as we have deficits, for me it's an accounting question, you borrow. But if you are borrowing, by the time you can see from the figures that by the time you pay compensation, interest and whatever, you know, your tax revenue is gone. So in fact your deficit is almost equivalent to capital expenditure. Why are you in the short end of the market borrowing for you know, capital expenditure? Mm -hmm. And this is one segue into the capital markets. But if you are going to borrow, you must also learn to pay through mechanisms like sinking fund, the service reserve and the rest. Thank you very much.